Our uh, next speaker is a uh, MSc candidate in, uh, in, in civil engineering here at the University of Waterloo. And his name, which is not on the screen yet, is uh, Fraser Lord. And uh, Fraser is working on the design and project management and, uh, you know, CO2 footprint, uh, life cycle analysis, the, these aspects of the design uh, process that have to be undertaken uh, before you even start your front end engineering and design of a specific site. So this is classical design engineering that uh, Fraser is uh, working on. Fraser? Good afternoon. Thank you, Maurice, for the introduction. Uh, so <coughs> uh, it was a good setup, uh, talking about the cavern and its various requirements. I'm going to shift the perspective to a bit of the, the bigger picture. We're, um, from my research, I was looking at the creating a design framework for the entire system. So um, as we were talking about the Hunthof CAS facility in Germany, uh, this is a picture of it above. It's a 290 megawatt facility rated for three hours of power production. Uh, you can see the two cavern wellheads up the top and the facility itself down below. The other example that Maurice mentioned was the McIntosh, Alabama facility, which is a 110 megawatt, uh, 22 rated, hour, rated output, 22 hour rated output facility. So to give you a scale, uh, in Ontario, OPG operates uh, hydro dams from ranging in power from 0.8 megawatts to 1400 megawatts. And the, uh, the large nuclear Bruce power plant um, generally produces 6,200 megawatts. So for objectives, I'd um, like to convey how sort of the, the whole system works together in CIS. I'd like to talk about some of the design requirements involved in a, a case project. And we'll look at how a case project fits into um, the triple bottom line. And just for clarification, when I say case, it's the easy way of saying CAS, or compressed air energy storage. It's a real mouthful. And my voice is bad right now. So, <coughs> so just to give you an outline, uh, I'll introduce CAS, we'll get talking to the, about the design systems, and then frame it in the triple bottom line context. So as a reference point for thinking about CAS, it's initially easiest to think about it as, uh, okay, things are appearing right away, that's fine. Initially easiest to think about it as a natural gas turbine. So in this particular example, I think it's uh, the engine on an airplane, but power generating turbines work very similarly. So typically, you have the compression half of the facility, or the compression half of the turbo machinery, and then the combustion and expansion stages where the power is generated. So in CIS, it's energy storage because we have storage in between these halves, which breaks the facility into two components. And this has several advantages we'll talk about. So for our storage component, we typically use uh, salt caverns because it's the cheapest um, which has been discussed a little bit. So in this particular picture, uh, you can see this is the ground surface here cut out. And so the giant white area below is a, a large salt dome that's kilometers deep. And in here, the colored cylinders are actually solution mined uh, salt cavities. And so that's the physical storage aspect of it. And so these caverns can be tens of thousands to millions of cubic meters large. So when you put these aspects together, you get images um, like the one in the bottom left here, where we've got uh, the turbo machinery and the cavern together. So you've got a compressor, which is typically in multiple stages for efficiency, um, your cavern storage, and two to three stages of expansion power um, which is, again, for efficiency reasons. Um, <clears throat> so newer systems or newer case systems involve a recuperator and other techniques to improve the efficiency of the system. Uh, newer ideas like just having a traditional natural gas turbine where you essentially append compressed air onto it uh, are developing as well, and they all have different advantages and disadvantages. The two existing case facilities have specially designed expanders just for their facilities. Uh, so if we break this down into sort of uh, more of black box thinking, 
there's four main components to a case facility. The compression stage here, which is again usually in multiple steps, axial and centrifugal compressors, and the expansion stage over here where the air is expanded. So the little bit more complicated part comes in between. You notice that the diagrams are in blue and red, and so that's sort of color-coded to the temperature of the air. So you know, as the compression stage finishes, the air is quite hot, and then it enters what I refer to as the thermal energy management system. I'll talk about why this is necessary in a second, but this is usually, or in conventional case systems, like the two that are already existing, this is intercoolers between the compressors, um, gas burners to heat the air between expansion stages. Uh, in newer adiabatic CAS systems, um, none of which have reached utility scale projects yet, they use thermal energy storage in sensible or latent heat through oil or uh, molten sand. And there's a ton of different ideas out there for that. So we need this because, you notice the air storage is all light blue because if we stick hot air down into our salt cavern, uh, you will get stability and rapid shrinkage in the cavern due to salt creeping prop properties. So in essence, um, case can be considered like a battery as well as a natural gas turbine. It's sort of the best of both worlds, uh, but we'll get to that. But in operation, typically draws power during periods of low demand. Uh, and releases air to power the turbines during periods of high demand. So in this um, particular sort of methodology, it's usually referred to as load shifting. And so you'll see this is actually an example of a day of operation in the Huntdorf's life on the power grid that it's associated with. And so you'll notice how the peak demand periods have been cut off by using case to generate power and the trough periods have increased demand, which allows us to make much better use of our baseload power. <coughs> so, uh, as uh, Jay mentioned, case and pumped hydro storage are generally the two economically feasible, large-scale, long-duration energy storage facilities. Uh, case has fast startup times, fast ramping ability, usually, 10 to 20% in a minute, which is, is pretty good even by natural gas turbine standards. And so it can be used for a multitude of purposes, such as uh, it's often talked about um, integrating wind power into our grid. So we use that variable wind generation to meet predictable, relatively predictable energy demands. And so an example of this was taken from a, a study by Andrew Ford for Ontario, where to balance out uh, wind farm power production to, to a, a steady 1,000 megawatts, we would need 1,000 megawatts of case production and 1,000 megawatts of compression power. And that way, we can almost totally level out the power um, from that wind farm. You'll notice, to achieve the same thing, we would need twice as much combustion turbine power uh, because to do this, you have to run, on average, 1,000 megawatts of combustion turbines and then just ramp them up and down depending on how the wind's blowing. And the disadvantage of this is that we have 1,000 megawatts of natural gas burning all the time, which uses a lot more fuel and doesn't help us meet our, global, our carbon reduction goals nearly as much as if we can just use wind power and then a little wind power with the help of some natural gas or fuel-free if you're installing a diabetic. So let's move into discussing uh, some of the design features of one of these facilities now that we've got an idea of what's involved in one. So the design of a lot projects, large engineering projects, should always start with the purpose. What is the goal of this facility? And so it's going to serve a multitude of purposes, um, generally categorized to load shifting, uh, renewable energy integration or emergency power and spinning reserves. Uh, it will have numerous functions depending on which grid it's integrating with and what services that grid needs. So to achieve this, um, we usually expect the facility to last a certain time. Um, the Hunter Oil facility has demonstrated these facilities can last 45 years or more. Um, 
in comparison to batteries, which generally last 10 to 15 years. And the number of cycles will impact how long the facility lasts. But again, in a very minor way compared to batteries, where if you regularly deep discharge a battery, uh, it kills it pretty quickly. For some types of batteries, flow batteries are a little better with that, but case uh, can cycle almost infinitely, which is a serious benefit. <clears throat> In terms of other primary design parameters, there's a power output we're looking to meet, um, storage volume to be able to produce power for so long, and the recharge time, which has to do with how it's being operated and your periods of low demand energy. And so just as an example here, we have the number of start and stops for the Huntorf's mechanical equipment from 1978 through 2000. You notice how um, generally what the takeaway we can get from this graph is that its function in the surrounding grid has changed to adapt with the grid that it's a part of. And so flexibility is necessary when you're considering the purpose of the facility and how it'll function. <clears throat> so following from the primary design parameters, uh, I selected a few secondary design parameters that I think were most critical to project success. <clears throat> and this was generally in terms of maintaining or achieving your power output, which is governed mostly by the uh, expander temperature and pressure inputs, but within the limitations uh, not only of the turbo machinery, but of the cavern's operating ability. So to avoid risks that have been talked about, such as cavern stability, ground surface subsidence, and excessive cavern volume loss from creep uh, and other mechanisms, uh, you need to carefully consider your operating pressures and temperatures. So <clears throat> this is a general or a broad design framework that I put together uh, that can be broadly applied to any, any case project, really. We don't need to look at the details, but again, generally, we start with the purpose, then we look at the what and the where. How are we going to make this facility achieve its purpose, and where should it be to best achieve its purpose? So, you know, you need to think about um, where it's going to connect to the grids, the local environment and society around where that facility will go up, and how different things like choice of fuel will impact social and environmental impacts. <clears throat> and then so we get into from there the broader, not broader, the more specific technical details that engineers love is the <clears throat> consideration of the turbo machinery and the mechanical systems, the geotechnical aspects of the cavern and the energy production and electrical sides and how these three multidisciplinary roles will work with each other, because any change in one system needs to be verified that it's still okay for the other systems. So then let's look at the triple bottom line context, uh, because it's no longer acceptable for engineers to just hash out the technical details and then pitch the projects. Um, I think as the pipelines have started to demonstrate, those projects will meet a lot of resistance. It's very important that stakeholder engagement happens early on in these projects now. So again, we've got a multidisciplinary project between geotechnical, mechanical, and electrical systems, which in itself involves a lot of risks just in controlling uh, how these systems work together. But none of the engineers working in these departments can forget the impacts of their system to the environment, society, and the economy. So let's look at, very briefly, some of those potential impacts. So socially, there's some benefits to do with CASE. Uh, obviously, it's uh, an electricity producing facility, which is, offers services to the grids and people use electricity at home, so that's a service to them. Uh, we wouldn't be able to maintain our lifestyle right now without electricity. If you also think about case displacing natural gas, it's also benefits to do with health uh, from reduced air pollution and um, particulates, acidification, other sort of environmental and social combined benefits. But there's some impacts that you can't neglect, such as noise, uh, aesthetics, local, the health impacts on local people, and <coughs> most certainly the risk of ground surface subsidence from the cavern. Uh, if you're going to unsettle the foundations of someone's house, they won't be very happy about it. 
<clears throat> so moving on to some environmental considerations. Uh, again, we have benefits if you're displacing case, uh, or sorry, if you're displacing combustion turbines with case, uh, it will almost universally use less natural gas, even if you're using a conventional case system for several efficiency reasons. And if you're using an adiabatic facility that's fuel free, that further reduces that greenhouse gas potential. But there's further benefits uh, compared to some other systems, such as reduced land use compared to hydro, or if you're looking at batteries, uh, there's much less non-renewable resource consumption. And by that, I mean minerals such as iron and, and lithium and arsenic and all the mining that goes into getting those metals out. A case facility you might have to build once every 25 to 45 years. Batteries you're going to have to build once every 10 to 15 years. So that, fields, that battery facility has to be constructed two to three times over to reach the same lifespan as a case facility. And then we use a lot more metals and minerals. Uh, of course, there's some environmental problems as well. It's not perfect. Uh, it still produces greenhouse gases, uh, no matter what you do, just involved in construction and everything, but I won't go into the details. The major environmental barrier to case is often viewed as the brine disposal. So to make a million cubic meter cavern, you typically make seven to eight cubic meters, million cubic meters of brine. You've got to do something with all that. Um, there's no easy answer to that, but it can be deep well injection or use for de-icing roads. Uh, if you're lucky, you can just dump it in the ocean. <laughs> but most people aren't close enough for that. <clears throat> so just to touch on the economics, I think uh, those will be covered much better by someone else in the presentations. But obviously, you've got capital and operation costs, capex and opex. Um, an adiabatic facility will typically cost more up front, but you save on the fuel later. Both facilities will require maintenance. It's all fairly standard. And then you've got revenue sources. So this facility is providing services to the energy market and the ancillary services. And those will be monetized depending on what the energy grid it's a part of needs and the regulations around that grid. And it raises a very good question whether Canada and North America's regulatory agencies around energy markets are appropriately adapting the regulations to meet, try and help us meet our decarbonization goals. And there's also very interesting points you can discuss about how increased renewable penetration will impact these markets and how that'll conversely impact the case. <clears throat> so uh, hopefully everyone's got a better picture of what CASE is as a whole system, um, learned about some of the design parameters and inputs that goes into designing one of these facilities, um, understood that we can't do major infrastructure projects like this without upfront stakeholder interaction, and uh, maybe started thinking about regulatory changes and what's needed to get where we want to go in terms of environmental goals. Thank you. I'll take any questions. And again, no, no. No questions from the uh, from the internet. A couple of uh, people have uh, hopefully they can hear us. Written in <laughs> and asked whether or not these uh, presentations are going to be available on the. Uh, on the web? And the answer is yes. All of these uh, presentations, the uh, people who have made them, like Fraser and Jay and others, have been kind enough to sign off and allow us to put them on the web. So these will be available. Thir furthermore, at a later date, uh, once all of the term papers for this course are in, uh, the term papers that form the basis for these presentations will also be posted on an open file on the web uh, for you to, to access. To find out what is posted, visit the WISE website. So the, the WISE website is uh, very well known. Just type in WISE Waterloo Energy and you'll get to the website immediately. Y stands for the Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy. And our salt uh, cavern projects 
compressed air projects are being carried out under the banner of the Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy. As part of the, shall we say, the uh, thrust towards decarbonization of the energy sources in, in Canada. Are there any questions for the uh, general uh, design approach that, uh, that Fraser has outlined uh, here? Yes. <coughs> uh, I like how you mentioned stakeholder engagement, so I'm curious what you mean by that exactly. Like who are the key stakeholders that you think need to be engaged up front? Is it the local communities or other? Um, does it involve other okay. stakeholders as well? Well, I should precede that by um, that sort of emphasis, I admit, was um, inspired by a local a presentation I went to recently in Waterloo about uh, the development of net positive commercial buildings. Uh, it was a professor from UBC who uh, led um, the proposal and development of a net positive commercial building at their school. And so he said uh, that, that was obviously one of the most important things. Now things were a bit different being on a university campus, but um, the point is, is that you need to sell this to people because uh, people are ultimately sort of the, the people buying this. People are the people buying this. But, um, so when you're talking about a case project, um, there's a whole bunch of stakeholders, and I think that's in any major infrastructure project. Definitely um, local environmental groups, such as uh, the conservation authorities, like the Grand River Conservation Authority here in Waterloo. You would need to talk to the MNR in case of Ontario, or just whoever is involved in environmental regulations in general for the project site. There's definitely gonna be uh, the local residents. Uh, they're gonna wanna know about this and should, in truth, be informed about the risks as well to, um, in, in an informative way that doesn't exaggerate or undermine um, the trust that they place in engineers and the jobs they do. Uh, local governments, of course, as well, and uh, definitely whoever, the regulatory bodies for the grid that energy the energy storage facility is gonna be a part of, in Canada, the ISO, OPG um, would definitely be involved as well as the major sort of utility company. Um, just name a few, I'm sure there's more. Uh, hard to, to nail them all in one go, but. For those who don't know the acronyms, OPG is the Ontario Power Generator, generator uh, which is one of the two companies that uh, Ontario Hydro was uh, split into a few years back the other one being the distribution company, which is called Hydro One. And IESO is the Independent Electricity S System Systems Operator. Operators. And these are small companies. Well, actually everybody that does any electrical generation into the grid in, in uh, Ontario is a member of IESO. And these uh, can vary all the way from very small uh, solar uh, systems to very large uh, nuclear power plants so that all of these people at some level are stakeholders. Now, up to now, people like Fraser and uh, Jay uh, have presented CAES as being a means of factoring in more renewable power. In fact, the two currently operating CAES projects in the world were not intended to do that. They were intended to be partnered uh, for example, in the case of Hundorf in Germany. Hundorf is paired with a nuclear power plant in, in nearby Bremen, isn't it? I Sounds think. right. Yes, which is not very far from Hamburg <coughs> up in the northwest corner of Germany, where there are thick salt domes, by the way. Uh, and <coughs> it is paired with the nuclear power plant. So it is designed based upon load leveling or meeting peaks and uh, uh, peak demands, and also storing energy during the period when the demand is very low. So it was paired with the nuclear facility to make the nuclear facility more efficient, to allow it to integrate into the grid in a much, much better way without having to have absolute peak capacity for absolute peak deba demand. And uh, so that had nothing to do with renewables, really. But of course, now, with the increased thrust on decarbonization and renewables, we're looking for other services 
to be uh, provided to the to the grid to to the people that use electricity. Some of those services are, of course, well-known grid issues. Like when you ramp up suddenly in, electri in, in electrical demand, this happens at seven o'clock in the morning. Okay, and everybody gets up and turns on the electrical coffee pot, right? And uh, turns on all the lights, you know, and uh, in the morning. That's a, it's a very steep peak in the morning. I think it's the steep, steepest peak in the day usually. Uh, well, you've got to bring a whole bunch of reserves online. Uh, some of these are what we call spinning reserves. In other words, they're there, right there, working, waiting to give you power. And others, you have to kind of wait for some time. Uh, CAES has uh, what kind of a ramp up time? It Two, three minutes? In yeah, that, in, uh, that, in that range. Five so minutes to full power. From, five minutes to full power. From minimum so load. That gives you a kind of an idea of where it fits into the ramp up. So it allows you to not have brownouts in the morning when you plug in your coffee pot. Okay, it, it balances that, that up-ramping. Well, it turns out that it also is useful in balancing down-ramping, when you have to get rid of power fairly suddenly. And when does that happen? That happens at 11.01 p.m., you know, after you turn off CBC News, right? Or whatever your news channel is, and then, oh, bedtime. And there's a very sharp drop at about 11 p.m. when people shut down the lights in their house and the televisions and the other electrical devices. And the CES facility also serves to level off that down ramping. So it, it provides the, what we call ancillary services to the grid, helping the grid function in a, more, in a more efficient way. Now, a battery can do that very, very quickly, but at substantial environmental cost with all of the issues in battery manufacturing, battery disposal, um, uh, it's, it's not an environmentally friendly process yet, although there's a lot of research going on to try to make these more, more environmentally friendly. When Fraser talked about the, the stakeholders and the local environmental groups, we must understand that CAES is extremely environmentally, f environmentally uh, low, low impact environmentally, with the possible exception of the disposal of the brine. And if there are markets for the brine, then the brine serves as a chemical feedstock. Many of the products that we use today, and not just the salt on your table, but many other products have uh, sodium chloride as part of the industrial process. So the brine actually has uh, a market value. Uh, so creation of salt cabins generates saturated brine. Saturated brine has some value can also be used and is being used in some jurisdictions as a winter uh, de-icing agent because when you uh, spray brine onto the roads it has an instant effect. It starts corroding the ice instantly uh, much faster than say granular salt which can be actually knocked off the road very easily. Brine, it's there, it's working immediately. And of course uh, brine has been uh, disposed deep deep in sedimentary basins for, for decades. So these are some of the uh, issues in brine disposal. But other than brine disposal, a uh, compressed air energy facility uh, would have a very small surface footprint. Underneath the ground, it might cover a half a square kilometer, perhaps more, perhaps underneath the lake, in Lake Huron. But at the surface, it's actually quite a compact system involving air compressors, uh, uh, expanders, and perhaps heat storage uh, facilities. Yes, uh, a question here from the audience. I'm going to ask, uh, make, ask you to make a comment and also ask a question. One thing that might be of interest to people, if you could exp um, sort of discuss case in the context of Ontario now with its overcapacity of electricity and the negative uh, pricing. And then the question I was going to ask, is could you maybe discuss some of the technical difficulties with reinjection of brine, since that seems to be the most environmentally friendly approach? Well, first I can comment on the, um, uh, a little bit on the, the context of the electricity grid in Ontario. It's a very complicated subject and I'm not an expert, but uh, I can tell you that based on some, I think it was 2014 data I saw that uh, <coughs> Canada actually 
generally it exports energy to all surrounding provinces and uh, states as well as imports from them uh, because we've got an excess of baseload power largely due to our um, generous amount of nuclear power which is good for keeping our electricity prices low as they have over the past decades um, but uh, creates a lot of ex excess power during the night and so energy storage for peak shaving as Dussault mentioned that Huntdorf and all McIntosh were designed for is uh, well suited for Ontario and then you know, that energy is, is free or uh, we actually sell below cost often to like the state of Michigan for example. So if we can capture that uh, and use it during our peak hours when we actually import energy sometimes uh, would strike me as being very efficient although there's debates about whether or not it economically works out. Uh, <clears throat> to give you uh, reference of scale, if we captured a quarter of the energy we exported, I think it was in 2014, uh, we could meet all of our import demands for energy, uh, which is no, by no means a, a small feat, but uh, would go a long way. And so that's, that's about sort of the base load versus peak load. Most of the peak load and the, uh, the load following is done by natural gas. So this would be an ideal location for case facilities to fit into our energy mix uh, to displace some of that natural gas turbines uh, while also being better able to integrate wind that's being installed all the time into our power grid because I didn't really get around to having time to say it but uh, case operates much more environmentally friendly than a natural gas turbine and in very large part of that is because the part loading efficiency of a natural or a natural gas turbine is very low uh, and case operates on average like at full load usually I think it's 33 percent more efficiently than a natural gas turbine and then so when you start to factor in part loading uh, you know it's it's miles ahead of that's for a conventional case facility it's miles ahead of a natural gas turbine um, a diabetic could in theory be even more environmentally friendly but other questions starting to come into factor there there, uh, Dr. Fraser referred to the uh, ne negative pricing. In uh, large, complicated grids, for example, in Texas, we have the ERCOT uh, system there, which is, by the way, not hooked into other grids in North America. They are a little unity of their own. Uh, they, uh, they have uh, a lot of wind power at certain times of the day, a little bit of solar. And the interesting thing about wind power is that once you paid for the capital cost of, the, of your turbines, then you just might as well let them spin. So turning them off and then turning them on again is actually complicated or more complicated than letting them spin. So that uh, in Texas, there are subsidies for wind power, as we have in Ontario. We have subsidies for wind and solar power. For one thing, in Ontario, the, the grid, OPG, must accept all of the wind power and solar power being, being generated. They don't have a choice. They're required to. So they, they do have this surplus energy. And at those times, even though the price is negative, the price, in other, in other words, that OPG is offering other generators is actually negative, because the wind power people have very, very low operating costs, they're still making money allowing their turbines to spin, despite the fact, of, uh, sorry, because of the subsidy. That's, that's life. And uh, there's a lot of people that think that that's not an appropriate way to run a grid, and other people say it's necessary. Happens in Texas, happens in Ontario, and I'm sure it happens in some other jurisdictions that are more and more heavily uh, wind-loaded and solar-loaded. Brine disposal. Uh, in fact, I'm uh, negotiating right now for a, a bit of funding from the uh, uh, Natural Resources Canada to actually uh, have a master's student funded on the issue of uh, brine disposal. Uh, and I would rather use the word brine use and brine disposal because the, the object is to, of course, use as much of the brine as possible before you have to dispose it deep in sedimentary basins. But the brine disposal view is that deep in the... Uh, sedimentary basin of, of southwest Ontario, uh, near, the, near, the, near the bedrock, we have a sandstone unit, not very permeable and porous, but uh, 
some of you have heard of the Potsdam sandstone uh, in the Kingston area of eastern Ontario. It's the kind of the equivalent, and it may serve as a suitable uh, site for the disposal of the quantities of brine that, that we're talking about, which in the context of the geological capacity for storage at depth is not very, is not very large. So that is something that uh, we're going to be pursuing as part of our research work here in the next few uh, years. Thank you.